I had a lovely little peruse at the library and I actually feel like I scored quite well. They were having a book sale and they were selling books on this table for a dollar each. And then just before I went up to purchase the six books that I decided to get, they announced over the loudspeaker that they were doing a sale for the last hour that they were open. And instead of a dollar per book, it was going to be a dollar for every three books. So instead of spending six dollars, which I was already pretty happy about, I spent two. There were plenty of books on sale, but the ones that most appealed to me was the manga, obviously. So they actually had volume one of Dawn of the Arcana. I have heard mixed things about this one, but I've always been curious and what better way to try it than for 33 cents for the first volume, you know? Then a manga series that I actually have been interested in, I just haven't gotten around to trying out yet, is Natsuki's Book of Friends. Now they did not have volume one or volume two, but they had three, four, five, six, seven. So I picked up these and I just think that that's quite a good way, like I will still have to buy or borrow or try and find one and two but like I will be able to try out quite a big chunk of this series and I'm really excited about that. It's been a while since I looked into this but from memory I think this is about like a bed and breakfast that takes care of spirits which just seems cozy and adorable. Definitely right up my alley. Now let's have a quick chat about the books that I borrowed because I did still borrow a bunch. Two of the four books that I got are graphic novels. The first that I picked up was Feelings. A Story in Seasons by Manjit Thap. I've never heard of this before, but when I saw it, it just looked beautiful. And the illustrations are gorgeous as well. And this, from what I can tell, is a sort of like a chronicling of this person's experience of mental health and the ups and downs of that and how they sort of coincide with the seasons. It says, come along on a gorgeous visual journey through one young woman's year of emotions, from the saturated highs of early summer to the gray isolations of late winter. So even though I think it's gonna be a bit of an emotional journey, like the color palette and like the imagery in here, I mean, obviously I haven't read it yet, but it's just beautiful. It feels very cozy and comforting and warm. So this was a total surprise and I'm really looking forward to it. Next is a graphic novel I've been meaning to read for quite a while, it's Persepolis. Now I know a lot of people will know of this and have read this, um, I've heard quite good things about it and I, like I said I've just always wanted to get around to it and just never have but I saw it at the library and thought that this is my chance. Although I've heard people speak very highly of this I don't actually know a lot in terms of what's included. It's very simple sort of black and white panels and I think it's about the Islamic Revolution and this um, it's autobiographical as well from memory. Next I got out a YA that I have actually tried to read before and DNF'd and that is We Are Okay by Nina LaCour. I got this out a few months ago uh, mostly just because the cover's pretty and I know we stock it at work and I don't know if it was me or if it was the book but I remember trying to read it and just not flowing with the actual writing. You know when you have that feeling where you're like it's I just couldn't take in what I was reading. I kept rereading the same sentence over and over again. So I'm thinking it might be me. On top of that, I have since listened to Nina Lacour's new book, Yerba Buena, on audiobook, and I really, really enjoyed that. So th that's made me want to revisit this and see if I can get along with this book. An intimate whisper that packs an indelible punch. We Are Okay is Nina Lacour at her finest. This generously crafted and achingly honest portrayal of grief will leave you urgent to reach across any distance to reconnect with the people that you love. So it might be a little risky of me, but I want to give this book a second chance. So we will see how we go. And then finally, a book that I'd never heard of, but as I was sort of preparing to check out, I spotted it in the corner of my eye and I just thought it looked kind of amazing. And that is The Past is Red by Catherine M. Valenti. And Hank Green actually blurbed it. He said, The Past is Red is magical realism meets the garbage patch. Every page is a new and surprising invention. It's hilarious and sad and filled with an inexcusable amount of wisdom. And I was actually planning on picking up a book by Ken Liu, but they didn't have the one that I was after. And when I saw that he blurbed this as well, I just felt like, I don't know, maybe this book was just waiting for me. And we all know that I'm a sucker for magical realism and short books. So I'm quite hopeful about this one. Okay, so these are the four books that I've gotten out from the library and that we will be reading together in this vlog. So I have finished my first book for this reading vlog, Feelings, A Story in Seasons by Manjip Thap. This was such a beautiful graphic novel. It's just so warm. The illustrations and the color palette are just 
they're really gorgeous and like it's basically detailing um, this person's experience of mood fluctuations and anxiety fluctuations throughout the year and how her moods and her feelings sort of coincide with the changing of the seasons. And although she really struggles with her mental health and with depression and anxiety, and sort of like withdrawing and isolating herself and all of that sort of stuff. It never feels so down. It just, it feels like a very honest, but accepting kind of look at mood fluctuations. We do also get some really nice refreshing moments as well with Manjit though, especially in summer. Obviously being a graphic novel, it didn't take too long to read, but this one, it was a really quick read. There's not a whole lot of words. It really is about the images and they really take you on a journey. I especially loved this page um, of sort of talking about the ups and downs of moods and anxiety and like representing that as the snakes and ladders board and how you can sort of feel like you're moving forward and then be thrown many steps backwards and how, you know, it can sort of come up out of nowhere and be really unexpected. Like, I think this is a really effective metaphor for that lived experience. I certainly identified with it anyway. Basically highlighting how mental health and wellness is not a linear journey for many of us. After reading this, I just felt really validated and I felt really comforted. Like this was a really comforting read. Although it's literally chronicling someone's journey of mental ill health, the ups and downs over the course of a year, it was done in a really comforting kind of way. Manjit definitely shows herself experiencing the highs and lows and a lot of like um, comparison and like fear and anxiety around her work and performance. There's just a lot of pages that I feel are quite clever and really represent their message very well. Like as you're reading, there are no words on this whole spread and yet they speak volumes. All of the artwork and the paneling and the different size of the panelings and the focus of them, it's just really intentional and cleverly done. I just really liked it. It just gave me good feels. So it was definitely a worthwhile read and a nice surprise to have picked up from the library this trip, I think. Hello, I'm here because I need to do my makeup and get ready. And so I thought while I do that, I can talk to you about The Past Is Red. Firstly, I just love this cover. I'm not quite over it. And I don't know that I did this on purpose, but again, my nails kind of match. I've been, it's been a bit of a trend lately for me to paint my nails the color of the book that I've been reading. Anyway, this is a weird book set in sort of like a dystopian future, I guess. Hang on, mum's Marco following me. There's dad in the background. I don't think you can hear him because I've got my earplugs in, but he's strumming away. <laughs> Bye. Anyway, this is like a weird, I'd say like dystopian novella, I guess. It's basically set in the future after an ecological collapse. So there is no land on earth anymore. All of the Arctic ice has overflown, all of the rivers have melted, and the earth is now just one big ball of water. Some people managed to survive though, uh, and basically they are now living on, you know, like the big garbage patch in the middle of the ocean where like all the garbage just sort of like floats into one spot. Over a couple of hundred years, this has become a very big, very dense, sort of land mass. And so people live on this garbage mass in the middle of the ocean and it's called Garbage Town. Now it isn't some like devastating climate apocalyptic novel because it's set a couple of hundred years it seems like or at least a hundred years after the climate collapse. So we're not really getting scenes of people you know drowning and dying and all of that and we're not even really getting scenes of people struggling to figure out how to live in this new world. That's already been done. People are now living on Garbage Town. And a whole sort of culture or many cultures have arisen in this world. For example, there's some really incredible world building around how characters get their names. Like our main character's name is Tetley. And <laughs> you may recognize that word from somewhere um, like I did. Uh, and yeah, like just the way that these characters get their names. I won't spoil it for you because it was one of my favorite parts of the book, but it's just like a really clever part of the world building that makes you kind of get a sense of this strange culture. We meet Tetley when she's young. She's got a twin brother and they're really close when they're children. But then we sort of find out that something has happened where Tetley is like a hated, despised person in Garbage Town. She's treated really badly. And we do found, find out why, but it's sort of revealed over the course of the novel. So that wasn't the most pleasant thing to read about, to be honest. It's not overly graphic. It's just yeah, jarring, I think is the best way to put it. And I don't want to talk too much about the plot of this book because although there certainly is a plot, there's not like a massive complex one, you know, it is only a novella and I don't want to ruin it for you because this is definitely a book I'd recommend. I love Tetley and honestly, I think I loved her more than I loved the story itself. I still enjoyed the story, 
but it did take me probably, I don't know, maybe almost half the book to really get into it. Uh, but Tetley, I loved her voice. She was such a strong character right from the outset. And she is a voice that I feel like is going to stay with me. I also loved the commentary on hope and the sort of importance or the role that hope plays in a society. And I also really liked the way that we, as in us people living now, the people of the past in this book, are framed. Tetley and the people around her literally call us fuckwits. That's what we're known as. We're known as fuckwits. And they very often talk about us in a way that is both like disdainful, like they're almost mad at us for our, our lifestyle and the way that we treated the earth and like what we've done to the earth and the life that these people now have is a direct result of our actions or inactions too. But they're also kind of jealous of us uh, and they almost, a lot of them want to go back to the life that we have, even though they can see how detrimental it's been and how unsustainable it was. So many of them feel like that is their right and that's what they wish they had. Tetley, however, despite how badly she is treated, she's one of the few characters that we see like genuinely loves Garbage Town and who feels like Garbage Town is a wonderful place. And maybe not because she thinks it's like, you know, some utopia, but because she understands that it's the world that they have and that's all they can have. So she wants to love and enjoy it as best she can. And it's also hopeful, but not in like an optimistic way of like, you know, we figured out how to solve the climate crisis or that, you know, humanity is totally fine even after the climate crisis. Instead, it's more about the idea that, you know, even if only a small amount of humans survive, those humans will find a way to live and to love and to hurt each other and to be human. So I, I ended up really liking it, even though, like I said, it did take me sort of like, half of the book before I really got into it and I was enjoying it. Like I, it was a bit slow going. I think I read the first half over like two days. To be fair, I was sick, so I was taking my time anyway. But then by the time I got to halfway, I couldn't put it down and I read it all in one evening. For me, it was a really inventive, imaginative story and I've never read anything quite like it. And it did, although it wasn't like, like I said, it wasn't some kind of catastrophe book about the climate crisis. It did because we see these people living on a garbage patch and, you know, we see them interacting with items that have been discarded from our civilization. It did get you thinking, or at least it did get me thinking about all of my stuff, all of my stuff, most of which is going to outlive me. It was interesting seeing these characters interact with these items. Sometimes they knew what they were, sometimes they didn't. And just how items and objects are viewed very differently in this world because nothing new can be created. Uh, and so they really do just have whatever is already on Garbage Town or whatever washes up. And also watching the characters, not Tetley, but the characters around her, so many of them sort of at once resenting the past civilizations, but then also wanting to be the past civilizations and have that excess and no worry and all of that sort of stuff. So very much like a certain uh, image of what past civilizations were. But that did also get me thinking about even today, how a lot of people talk about and think about the wealthy in our society. So we despise and resent them, but then there's also a lot of the time not for everybody, but for enough, <laughs> there's this underlying sentiment of, I hate them not only for their excess and what they do and everything I disagree with, but I also hate them because they have what I don't. So I don't know, it was like a strange, quirky little book that I felt was really imaginative and unusual and just really unique. And a lot of these things I don't know that I was like consciously thinking about until after I put the book down. I think it was done in quite a subtle way. Like it was just this weird little story that the author was telling about a potential future. A weird story about a weird girl living on a garbage patch in the middle of the ocean a few hundred years in our future. And I don't know, I guess I just, I really enjoyed it. I have just a strong fondness for it now. And for Tetley as a character. I think she's really gonna be a character that stays with me for a long time. So that's my makeup done and that is me done with The Past is Red. I thought this was great. I really enjoyed it. And I have started Persepolis, but I'm going to get stuck into this and finish it hopefully today. Hello friends, it is later in the day and I am back to talk about Persepolis. 
what a special graphic novel this is. This is a pretty simply drawn but really powerful graphic novel memoir in which we follow the main character, who, you know, it's an autobiography basically. So the author, we follow her from when she's like a young child, sort of preteen age, living in Iran um, in a sort of really well-educated family, going to a French school um, with co-ed sort of really modern liberal sort of values and we see as the revolution starts to happen in Iran and how that impacts our main character and her family and then sort of the aftermath and the war with Iraq. After a couple of years of this her family decides to send her to Austria with sort of like a family friend and she shares with us her experience of like sort of trying to remain true to who she is while also dealing with the trauma that she's just experienced. Hello Harry? Sorry my cat is talking to me because I can never get a moment alone. Everything is about him. What was I saying? And also that sort of pressure to both assimilate, but for some people to also perform her trauma in a particular way. And how, I guess, a kind of guilt of the fact that she's really suffering and struggling in Austria, but with the awareness that her country and her family are literally going through a war back home. After a few years in Austria, she does decide to return to Iran. Um, and then we get sort of like an image of what Iran is like after the war, after the revolution now that the fundamentalists are very solidly in charge. And this was just a really powerful book. I couldn't read it all in one sitting. I sort of had to like take time with it. And especially while obviously like our author is in Iran, she witnesses and hears about some like absolute atrocities. But then on top of that, I think what I found so compelling about this and also just so scary, I guess is the best way of putting it, is just how quickly it all happened. How the revolution was seemingly a very leftist kind of movement and then it was kind of hijacked and turned into a really oppressive regime. And we see how very, very, very quickly everyone in the society and in particular leftists and women have their rights removed, have their rights that they have been enjoying for many, many years they just are completely removed. And I don't want to take away from this woman's experience and I don't want to oversimplify anything that's going on in the world, but I guess it just does make me think about how quickly and easily our rights can be removed, especially as women and disabled people and queer people, whatever like kind of marginalized identity people hold. This was a reminder that in so many ways, our rights are conditional and depending on who is in charge, those rights can be removed. And reading this was just such a strong reminder of just how quickly that can happen. This whole book was really powerful and it's a really small slice of life story. We get like silly little interactions between her and her friends. Some of them are very much rooted in a trauma response, but it's, it's, it's kind of slice of life in that sense. And in that way, it's a very grounded retelling of this lived experience. But there was one panel in particular that really just stood out to me as something that I think even out of context was really powerful. And that was when she returned to Iran and she's sort of reflecting on the women around her and how they're so concerned with, you know, making sure they're not wearing makeup, making sure that their ankles aren't showing, making sure that they aren't gonna get in trouble. They're not gonna get caught out and get in trouble. And while they're so distracted and concerned with all of these little things to make sure that they are physically safe and aren't gonna get in trouble. Yes, Harry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've gotta let him in. This is Harry. I think he was getting a little lonely out there. Hey, you okay? I don't know if you could hear his like howling wails <laughs> and meows. Have I been in here filming for a bit too long, baby? I'm very sorry. Okay, okay, he's fine now, he's fine. What was I saying? Right, when the women are distracted by all of these like objectively small things that could have a huge impact on whether they live or die, whether they're safe or not, they're obviously not thinking about the big things, about where their freedom has gone, how they're being oppressed in larger ways. I don't know, it was just really quite intense and harrowing. And I think a really important thing for me as an Australian, as a Westerner to be reminded of, that Iran was a vibrant, modern, liberal, educated country. And so quickly that was just shifted on its head. I'm not gonna pretend that I understand the nuances and the complexities of the situation, but I still think reading things like this is just a really important thing and a really powerful thing. So I think this story incredibly well, like it humanizes the experience of Iran, but I think it also like as a mirror, sort of it's a reminder of how important it is not to be complacent about our own democracies and our own rights as well. 
So I tried, I really tried to read We Are Okay by Nina LaCour, but again, I just, I wasn't connecting with the writing. I think this time it's less to do with like my mental health and my headspace and more to do with the fact that I have other books that I want to read more. And so that part of me that might normally push through really didn't want to, really just was not showing up for me this time. So I just made the call. I don't think this is a book for me and I will not be trying for a third time. I did, however, read uh, this, Dawn of the Arcana Volume 1, which is one of the manga volumes that I bought in the library book sale. And let's just say that I'm glad I only paid 33 cents for this because this is absolutely not my kind of thing. Basically, in this, we're introduced to this world in which there are two sort of factions living on this quite small island and they've been at war and they hate each other all the time and apparently when the war and the tension between these two nations kind of gets bad enough then they sort of like attempt like a royal marriage to like kind of ease the tensions for a little bit but we're told that this rarely works for long anyway we're introduced to our main character princess nakaba who is from one of these nations who is basically being married off to the prince of the other nation. We're also introduced to these two men. One is Prince Caesar, who like is the prince of the enemy country who she's being married off to. And the other is Loki, who is, I think like, uh, I don't really understand a whole lot, but he's basically her attendant and he's been her attendant forever. Like we get a scene where he's like a, a young person, but he's grown up when she was a baby. So we know that he's much older than her, but also that he's been in her life for a very long time. But also he is part of like a group of people who have some kind of like power uh, in this world. I don't really understand a lot about this power, except that it does make them strong um, and sort of special in some way, but also that that makes them feared and they are oppressed, like they are a serving class. So Loki is Princess Nakaba's servant, like attendant basically, but like they really like each other like, and he seems like dedicated to her. And Caesar is horrible. He's possessive, he's selfish, he's like aggressive, he's borderline violent. And there's plenty of what I would describe as kind of rapey lines coming out of his mouth, like threatening assault on Princess Nakaba because, and reminding her that she is his property. But one thing that is framing all of this is that we're constantly reminded of how good looking Prince Caesar is. And it's also starting to suggest that maybe he's, you know, he's he's got some trauma, which is why he's such a bad guy. And maybe it's Princess Nakaba who could help him through that trauma. So it's setting up this weird ass love triangle, I think, with her attendant who has been serving her since she was a baby, who is clearly much older than her, and the prince who is, I don't know, at the very least showing some solid red flags at this point. So this is clearly absolutely not for me. Uh, I don't want to read volume two, no desire whatsoever. Uh, the only reason I got through this is because there's not a lot of dialogue. So it's very, very quick. I think it was like barely even half an hour. However, I do feel like that was half an hour wasted. So yeah, not for me, do not recommend even at 33 cents. So I feel like uh, this vlog's been a bit all over the place. We started out very strong. I really liked the first three books that I read. And then the last two, I mean, I had a DNF and then a I would have DNF'd if it had have taken me longer than half an hour to read. I don't know that I can really pick a favorite for this. I think Persepolis and The Past of Is Red are both books that I'm still thinking about. I mean, Persepolis, obviously, I feel like even though I don't know everything and this is only one perspective, I do feel like it was a really important educational experience to go through and read this book and the human impact of this part of history. I don't know, I think it was a really powerful read. The past is read, I feel like has kind of crept up on me. I don't know, just a lot of themes and imagery and characters that are gonna stay with me from this really short but quite impactful novella. And then Feelings, I really liked this too. It was very warm and cozy and just affirming. And then although I only got two chapters into this before DNFing, I still preferred it over the entire experience of this one, so. Take from that what you will. But that concludes this month's library reading vlog. I hope you enjoyed hanging out with me this month and reading these books. Thank you so much if you made it all the way to the end of this video. And a big thank you goes to my wonderful patrons over on Patreon. And especially big thank you goes to Livia, Lynette Brown and Marie for their very generous support. But that's all from me for now. I will talk to you in the comments and in the next video. Until then, happy reading. Bye.